Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending. Welcome to this workshop. Through the copy editor's eyes, tips for writing with the flow, clarity, and power. Your presenter is Dr. Vincent Price, PhD. A short bio about Dr. Price. He is a native of Mississippi. Dr. Price is a clinical assistant professor of teaching and learning at the University of Central Arkansas, where he trains future teachers. He owns and operates Price Stamp of Approval, an academic editing and writing consulting business. Through this service, he has assisted numerous graduate students and professors to improve and finalize their writing. He enjoys traveling with his wife and tap dancing. Dr. Price, welcome. Thank you for being here and the floor is yours. Thank you for that introduction, uh, Dr. Proctor. I appreciate it and thank you for this opportunity to to, to speak to everyone. Uh, let's, let's go. Let's see if I can share my screen. Uh, Kim, let me know if this is not visible. Um, it is visible. Uh, and you see my PowerPoint? I see the PowerPoint. Perfect. All righty. All right. So it always makes me smile to uh, talk about writing. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing. So uh, by the end of this workshop, folks, you will be able to do at least three things. The first thing is going to be identifying areas for growth in your writing. It's not just going to be me lecturing about uh, this theoretical piece of writing, these dream things. No, it's going to be something that you're going to be able to look at uh, and through the lens of your own writing. See where you are, where there's some weak areas or where there are some areas where you can strengthen, there's some room to grow, okay? Second, you should be able to apply strategies that then strengthen those weaker areas so that your writing can um, inspire, motivate, move people um, in the direction that you want them to go. And then the third one, which I feel is more encompassing, altering your, your mindset uh, your, or your approach to writing. Instead of simply throwing words down onto a page, simply completing an assignment, complete, simply turning in a proposal, submitting a dissertation, whatever the case, I want that mindset to shift from reading like a writer and writing with the reader in mind because writing is a form of communication. We write to be read, we speak to be heard, we communicate to be understood. So um, these are the three things that we're gonna make sure we get out of this workshop here. So let's continue. Here's the agenda. Um, pretty straightforward. Briefly, you'll get to know me in a little bit more depth than what, uh, and what Kim shared, and then we'll dive right into making this more personal for you. So I'm going to uh, ask you to participate in, in a poll in which you actually are talking or thinking about your own writing and some areas for strength. Then we get right into the meat of it, uh, the three writing tips that I promised I was going to give you. Uh, then we apply that put that knowledge to the test. Again, we're not trying to be theoretical or anything like that. We're going to be relevant. We're going to be practical. Uh, and then I'll give you a free tool for you to use as you continue to write, as you continue to try to get published and um, get everything done. And then the last portion, close everything out, is the question and advice. I change it from question and answer because I want to I want this to be more of a community type feel. So you might have a piece of writing that you just finished or that you are working on or that you are struggling with. And so you might take this time, this questions and advice opportunity to ask for some advice. And we are all being able to um, grow from this exchange of 
advice, this exchange of experiences in regards to writing. So writing consultation in a miniature form. All right. Uh, and last piece of housekeeping. If you see or hear anything that you like, do me a favor, do me a solid, uh, create a post or a story on Facebook or Instagram, and then and tag me. Um, my tag for Instagram and Facebook is at price stamp of approval. And also, of course, don't forget to tag the organization at Black PhD Network. So again, anytime you see or hear something you like, screenshot it, put some little comments on it, tag us so we know uh, what you appreciate. And so others who did not attend this know the quality uh, that they missed. Okay, so without further ado, uh, ado, let's see. So uh, you know my name by now, Vincent Price. I'm from Mississippi. I grew up in a single parent home. My mother raised three children. I was the youngest uh, and the only boy. And um, she raised us to really care about how we presented ourselves excelling uh, in the way that we presented ourselves. So she made sure that we read well, we wrote well, we spoke well. Uh, coming from a family of educators, my mother has a degree in home economics education. I have several great aunts and great uncles who were in education in some capacity. And my sisters also went in, into education. So we still have that reinforcement of um, attention to presentation, attention to writing and speaking. Uh, and I also belong to a small African Methodist Episcopal Church, AME Church, and so small that it could probably, the whole congregation could fit in this small room that I'm in right now, which means that as one of the youth, I was always put up there to read a poem or read a speech, whatever the case. Again, reinforcing that, that writing, that literacy as well. And so all of that contributed to me becoming an English teacher uh, so that I can share what I knew with the younger minds. So I taught for about seven years between Mississippi and Arkansas, where I am now. And, um, and then during my PhD journey, I took time to start taking tap classes. Uh, so I'm an amateur, amateur tap dancer. And during also that PhD journey, through one, one very financially low summer, I started uh, price stamp of approval um, because I felt that one, I needed some kind of income because uh, I was struggling. And two, I had a skill that could, uh, could work to serve others. And I wanted to use that uh, in that capacity. So copy editor, writing consultant, giving people a new way of looking at writing and having them feel confident about their writing as they see themselves grow in it. So enough about me, here's, here's where we get some participation in. So if you have a smartphone, you can use the camera feature on your phone and take a and kind of scan that QR code or you can simply go to menti.com, that's M-E-N-T-I.com, and enter in the code 57938763. Whichever route you take should bring you to one question that asks you to share one area, at least in your academic writing, that you feel you want to strengthen. So any area in your writing, the writing that you do that you would like to strengthen. And that can come in various uh, forms. Could be organization, could be ideas, it could be brainstorming, it could be um, uh, formatting, it could be subject verb agreement, whatever the case. Okay, so take some time real quick to, to share. And then we'll, let's see what we have here. And, uh, and Kim, do you see the question up and one of the responses? Just want to make sure I'm. 
Yeah, uh, actually what I was gonna suggest, uh, Dr. Price, is that for those of you who maybe aren't prepared and don't have your phone or just aren't as techy as that, maybe you could drop that question into yeah. the chat and I will relay it to Dr. Price. I see some popping up on your screen, but if you aren't able to get to that uh, that website that he mentioned, you're welcome to drop it into the chat. So far, Absolutely. nothing is yet. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's see, being very intentional regarding specifying the topic in a realistic way, okay? We'll, we'll talk a little bit about intentionality today. Um, shifting away from speaking in the passive voice, mm -hmm. the daily thing. <laughs> uh, more being more concise, we'll, we'll talk about that. Identifying opportunities for publishing, how to organize the literature review, uh, research, and writing process, forever to frame a topic, and then don't know what articles will be best to cite. Mm -hmm. And more comfortable writing about myself. Oh, now that's that's another thing there. Then seemed to be some frustration uh, with the one at the bottom. Let's see. Okay. Kim, are there any others that have been added to the the chat? Um, I I have one of my own. I don't see any showing up, but I did have one of my own. Uh, finding and writing a really strong grant proposal for research opportunities. Okay, all right. And then we have how to write multiple articles from one data set, where to break it apart without being too repetitive. Oh, yeah, I'm in that, I'm in that state right now, that phase right now of doing that. Okay. Excellent. Um, one thing that I'll say um, for that will cover a lot of these is it goes with the intentionality piece. And so, and it also comes with um, creating more opportunities for that writing. So <clears throat> I used to be a wordy person and I'm gonna talk about this as well. I, well, I still am a wordy person to some extent. Uh, and so, I have to force myself. I have to be very conscious of what I'm writing and how I'm writing it, um, because I can slip back into that that whole fray, that whole phase of using more words than necessary. So the passive voice uses more words than necessary and weakens to some extent um, what you're trying to say. Um, and then being more comfortable writing about myself, I've also started doing that. And I'll touch upon that as well in this workshop. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you're doing, I feel. And I think you have to be okay with being vulnerable and with being, with saying what needs to be said. I used to have, I had a client once who had a lot of powerful things she wanted to say, but she just felt confined by the institution where she was working, where well, she was uh, working as a graduate student. But this was a self-imposed confinement. No one had ever said, you need to tone down what you're saying. You need to speak in this way. So oftentimes we just need to figure out what we're trying to say and why we're trying to say it, and then put that power back into that writing. And with time, with experience, with practice, it gets a little bit easier each time. Um, but thank you for all of your contributions. And I look forward to touching upon a lot of these, these points uh, as we continue. So <clears throat> back to the presentation. Um, if you do have any questions for me, um, feel free to put them in the chat and then Kim will get my attention and, uh, and then we can move forward from there, okay? So here we are, we're at the three tips. These are three tips that you can start applying today to your writing, okay? I am speaking from my experiences, not only as a writer, but also as a copy editor. 
all the majority of the sentence examples that you're going to see in this presentation are my own writing from things that for the most part are all published and I'll be showing you first drafts and then final drafts and talking about what led to that and the impact between the first and the, the final, okay? So, <clears throat> tip number one, someone mentioned the word intentional. Tip number one, using intention in your writing. So Dr. Price, what does that mean? Well. Writing is more than just hurling words onto a page. Writing is more than just typing up a proposal and sending it off. It's about communication. So the more that we are, the more intentional we are about what we say and how we say it, the more effective and the more successful we'll be about getting our point across and getting that effect across. So how can we do that? Well, I talked about it, touched upon it briefly, but wordiness is one, one big thing. One way that we can be uh, intentional, more intentional. I am a recovering wordaholic, if you want to use that term. Back when I was in 12th grade, AP English, my English teacher told me um, that I write like William Faulkner. And we had read William Faulkner recently, and I knew at that point that that was not a compliment. That was speaking to the lengthiness of my sen sentences. If you're not familiar with William Faulkner, he's a, he was an author from Mississippi who would write long sentences. And by the time you reach the end of that sentence, one sentence, you've forgotten what the first part was talking about. So I knew right then and there that I had to start paying attention to my use of words because I can get carried away. Even in my speech, I can get carried away. So let's look at this first example on the left. So <clears throat> originally I had written, in an attempt to expand the classroom presence of black literature, the silent approach contributes a counter story. So this sentence is talking about a different approach to teaching Black literature. So the highlighted, the yellow section is the part that we're going to look at in an attempt to expand the classroom presence of Black literature. That is a lengthy little introduction. I don't need in an attempt. I could shorten that to to expand the classroom presence of Black literature if I wanted to. What would be the difference between in an attempt to expand and to expand, well, it seems more confident. I'm not just attempting to do it, I'm doing it. Here's my purpose, to expand. Or if you flip over to the after column, <clears throat> I could even shift that expanding part to the end, depending on what I want to say and how I want to say it. The silent approach contributes a counter story that expands the classroom presence of Black literature. Notice that I don't say it contributes a counter story that tries to or that attempts to expand the classroom presence of Black literature. I think as writers, as scholars, as beginning scholars, as beginning writers, we, we play it safe by using extra words and attempt to try to, um, but I think it's in some cases, it's okay to leave those out and speak to the power that we feel that these things have. We can use the word may if we want to, but it's okay just to be, to speak to that, that strength that we feel that uh, these ideas have. So I don't need the, in an attempt to do this. Look at this second example. The before is we write to communicate to those who need to hear the message. Now, this particular sentence or sentence excerpt comes from the proposal for this workshop. So originally I written, we write to communicate to those who need to hear the message. You know, for me, I understand what I'm trying to say, but 
I feel that there's a better way of saying it without using as many words. Also, there's a lot of prepositions in there or the word to, to communicate to those who need to hear the message. When you see the word to repeating multiple times, more than two times in a single phrase or in a single sentence, then there might be some, some places where you can shorten your sentence some. <clears throat> because as you add more two phrases, the sentence gets longer and the sentence gets weaker, potentially, okay? <clears throat> so I changed it, simplified it to, we write to share and expose. Hmm. To share, that's the same thing as communicating to those who need to hear the message. But why am I sharing it? To expose it, uh, expose them to that information. So I changed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 words, reduce that to one, two, three, four. And I feel that that version is more powerful uh, and to the point. <clears throat> so before we shift from words, I want you to, to understand that in order to be, in order for a sentence to be meaningful, in order for a sentence to be powerful, in order for a sentence to be descriptive, it does not have to be long. I thought that it had to be long. I thought that my sentences had to be long in order to pack a punch, but that's not the case. Sometimes longer sentences weaken your message, weaken what you're trying to say. So when you can, shorten those sentences. Here's a, here's a way of doing that. So instead of provides an introduction to, this chapter provides an introduction to, hmm, provides an introduction to, that's the same thing as introduces. This chapter introduces blah, blah, blah. So one, two, three, four words reduced to one. Has the ability to, reduces to can. Could possibly, first of all, that's the same thing. If it's possible, then it can happen. So could works. Point it out, instead of those two, uh, two word verbs, just go with indicated. Uh, and last but not least, the aim of this chapter is to provide, that's just the same thing as <clears throat> in an attempt to. No, just say what the chapter provides, okay? If you're talking about purpose, don't say that the aim of it is to do this. Just to say, just say this thing does this. I wrote it, this is what it's designed to do, this is what it does, okay? Wordiness. This is an ongoing thing. You have to be intentional about those, um, the length of those sentences. But am I saying that all of your sentences should be short? No, not necessarily. Uh, some sentences need to be long. Um, <clears throat> but another part of being intentional, and this falls, uh, goes along with kind of talking about yourself a little bit to some extent, depending on how you do it, is being descriptive or, or narrative. So I think once I finished my, no, after I participated in the three minute th thesis, if you're not familiar with that, it's a fantastic, um, fantastic competition in which you basically have three minutes to talk about and explain your dissertation or your research with one PowerPoint slide. But ever since then, I started using narrative uh, and, and descriptions to tell my story, to connect with my audience. A little bit of narrative at the beginning, and then here's the, the research, is the deep content, and then maybe some narrative at the end. Because what the narrative or the description does, I feel, is it bridges that gap. So there might be someone who, <clears throat> is in your discipline, but might be unfamiliar with what you're trying to say. But that person is one of the stakeholders that needs to understand it. So how can you explain it 
so that that person really understands, really sees that this is an issue that we need to address. So I feel that one thing that you can do is by incorporating description or incorporating narrative, being very intentional about what you're doing. So <clears throat> um, one way of not doing it is by telling. So this is a problem, period. I'm not really convinced. All you're doing is just telling me it's a problem. Can you show me that it's a problem? Can you use some statistics that show me how pervasive this problem is? Can you put some faces or some names to this particular issue? Hmm. Look at the example. We're talking about food in this case. Meatloaf is delicious. I love meatloaf, especially when my mom makes meatloaf. I try to make it myself. It falls apart. The flavor is still good, but it just falls apart. But if I wanted to convince you that meatloaf is delicious and just stated meatloaf is delicious, exclamation mark, hmm, you might say, okay, this person thinks that meatloaf is delicious. I can't say more about that because that's all he's, he said versus me showing. Now, listen to this. See if you can hear how connected I am to this, this dish. Sure, the name may not sound appealing, but what's in a name? Picture this, steam rising, carrying the aroma of well-seasoned beef and onions into the air. As you remove it from the oven, you can still hear the flavor sizzling in the pan. The bright red swirl of the ketchup rests delicately atop the mask mass, cueing you in for the flavor experience like none other. As your knife gently cuts through to obtain a slice, the meat slowly droops lower, as if bowing before you, presenting to you its humble juiciness. Then you taste it. Cue the harps. You're in love. Now this one, I don't know about you, but this one, creates an image in my mind that goes far beyond meatloaf is delicious. This has depth to it, this, this showing passage. It has depth to it, it has um, dimensions to it as well. So from this, I can walk away from this paragraph knowing that this person or that I have a deep understanding and a deep love for this topic, meatloaf, okay? I created images, I used particular words, I, I just messed up around with sentence structure, had some short things, had some long things, used some more informal things, whatever the case, I had fun with it so that I could capture that love for meatloaf, okay? Why do I spend so much time on this? Oh, well, because you're gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna give you five minutes and you can write this on paper, you can type it up on a document, you're not turning this in for anything. It's not for grades, not for extra points. I'm gonna give you about five minutes to write a description of either a favorite food or a least favorite food. And instead of simply saying that it's your favorite, you like it, or you don't, you're going to show that, you're going to convey that love or that hatred in your description of it, okay? And then we'll take some time to share, maybe go into breakout rooms um, and uh, allow you to hear what you've written and see how other people have reacted or hear how other people have reacted to your, to your writing, okay? So five minutes, it's not going to be a novel. It's not going to be a masterpiece necessarily, but it's five minutes to capture your love or your hatred for a particular food, showing that that uh, that preference in your description. Okay, so um, I'm going to put five minutes on the clock, and uh, don't be shy. Don't be embarrassed. We're all learning. Five minutes. Start now.
in about a minute and a half, I want to get at least two volunteers who are confident they want to share their right. They're not afraid to share. They're not afraid of the growth experience. And they want to share that love, that hatred for that food. Um, I have one that I wrote up quickly if no one else does. I can, I, I want to wait and see if someone else has written one. Yeah, we got about 30 more seconds and then and we'll see. We got <clears throat> Kim is taking the lead for us. All righty, so let's get started. So <clears throat> do we have any volunteers? If you say you wanna, you wanna just go out there and you wanna share this, this piece that you just wrote in five minutes, you can put that in the chat. Um, and Kim, you can start us off. <clears throat> and then we can call on anyone else who wants to, to share. Let's hear what you have. Okay, well, this is not my best work, but you know, three minutes. Uh, three minutes no need to say that. I immediately thought of a food though. So here we go. Slimy, green. Nothing could be a more powerful reminder of the taste and feel of worms on my tongue. Whether it's fried, boiled, or blended into a dish of gumbo. I will refuse to eat it. It's not even worth picking out the pieces. I refuse. That's it. All right. So from there, first of all, I like the, the, the one word sentences at the very beginning. It's pretty nice. Um, and then I can, I can understand your hatred uh for well first of all you eat worms maybe i should have said my what i imagine the taste of worms. okay <laughs> okay all right um uh, and so what i also like was the repetition of i refuse so i refuse to do this and then you ended with i refuse so it's the small things like that that make a big impact okay love it thank you uh, can I get one more person who is not uh, going to hesitate, not afraid of just sharing this draft in process? Oh, here we go. <clears throat> Jan has shared one in the chat. Um, I'll read it. It's coming, describing mangoes. Okay, so I'm from a cold place that is warmed by the peeling back of orange yellow skin with teeth that pause their chattering to allow the communion of teeth, tongue, and lips over fruity flesh. Oh my. This firm flesh sing, singing calypso, reggae, and soca to the throat, insisting on warm, on warm, insisting on warm to combat this cold place, warmth. To insist this is not a fantasy, yellow juice trickles down the side of my jaw. Claude McKay said the tropics were to be found in New York, but Mango got a visa to Toronto. <laughs> Love it. All right. Nice. So what I like about this, what I love about this is the imagery. Uh, so, and you know how I can tell it? The imagery impacted me because it affected how I read it. Uh, this was the you know rough draft read, and so it it speaks to that. And so, what am I saying? Am I saying that everything that you write needs to turn into a story? No, uh, I but I am saying that. Thank you, Jan, for that. I am saying that there is room for narrative because the narrative adds power. The description adds power to what you're trying to say. But you might be saying, I don't have all that time, all that space. 
Well, you can simply put one word, a well-chosen single word can make a big impact. Um, to use a, a morbid example, there's a difference between the word kill and murder. The difference between the word murder and massacre. Both have the same, all three have the same outcomes, but they have a different degree of impact on the readers and then the listeners. So you can really, you can still be descriptive with one word. Kim used the word refuse. She could have said, I hate it, but hatred is not, it doesn't speak to that, that extra image that refuse has. Someone offers her this and she's, no, runs away from it. She's refusing. So choose your words carefully and be intentional about it. Let's move on. So tip number two, using punctuation to pace your readers, okay? So it's more than just using commas and periods just to follow the comma rules. Those things were meant to serve in the role of communication. So when we're talking about a punctuation, I like to use commas and dashes. Uh, people oftentimes use commas, but dashes for uh, people that I encounter are really beyond what, what their, their repertoire is. So I, I'm gonna read this left side. Notice that the left side has only one piece of punctuation and that's that question mark at the end. Who would have thought that I pencil and highlighter at the ready would accomplish the great feat of seeing myself in another character of identifying with another character, let alone Ellison's narrator? If I had to read that by yourself, more than likely you would have stopped, stumbled, tried to figure out what was grouped where uh, and with what and so on and so forth. So the commas or the dashes will be used to help pace the reader. If we want the reader to pause, if we want to set a certain part aside, we need to show that reader that this is an extra piece of information. So move over to the second example. Who would have thought that I, pencil and highlighter at the ready, would accomplish the great feat of seeing myself in another character, of identifying with another character, let alone Ellison's narrator? The commas and the dashes put pauses. If you're not familiar with a dash, understand that a dash is a, a dash does the same thing that commas do when we're talking about setting aside extra information. Um, and what dashes help do is reduce the amount of commas that you use in your sentences because the longer your sentences get, the more commas you might have, and it might be difficult to navigate. So dashes can help uh, satisfy that, that need for guidance and that need for pacing for your readers. So commas and dashes really go a long way. And then even, even down to sentence structure, folks, look at sentence number one. <clears throat> one may think that this second group of texts are apolitical, that they are avoiding real and serious issues because race matter is not centered for such texts. But the most important part of that sentence is the first part. And so here's what you have to do, especially when you have these long sentences, you wanna make sure that your, the important part is at the end, you land on the most important element. So you just rearrange it. Example two, because race matter is not centered for this second group of texts, comma, one may think that such texts are political, that they are avoiding real and serious issues. That is where it needs to be because I want it to be landing right there. And because what follows up, however, the opposite is true. So think about what you really are trying to emphasize and put that, land with that, because that will then contribute to the next sentence and so on and so forth. So think about your sentence structure. Some you just need to flip flop things to bring that emphasis out. And the third and final tip, writing to express, not impress. I don't know about you, but when I was in the PhD program, even before then, I've often found myself 
uh, trying to sound scholarly, sound academic, trying to impress people, um, impress my imaginary readers, rather than actually speaking the way I feel things need to be said. So writing to express emotions, anger, frustration, whatever the case. Um, and so when you do that, when you are trying to impress people rather than express what you're talking about, then you might be risking your writing voice. It doesn't sound like you. It doesn't sound much like anything. Look at the example on the left. I wrote this when I was a senior in high school. Trying to impress the teacher. This was the first essay of the year. A lesson is something that is learned throughout one's life. Lessons are learned when an individual goes through an experience that causes him to act sincerely and think carefully and thoroughly. As one progresses in age, he may begin to acknowledge the levels of importance of each lesson learned. Now at the time, I thought that this paragraph, and it's just a, it's a shortened version of the introduction paragraph, I thought that was the bee's knees. I thought, oh, oh, oh yes, blown away. But I look back at it and say that this is not saying much of anything. If you look back, you'll see that the word lesson is repeated several times. The word learned is repeated several times. When you have so much re repetition, that speaks to or that suggests that you're not really saying much of anything. Versus number two, it is always a part of how we got to be, yet it's not the only part. It is not the only component in our lives that matters, that is worth writing and talking about. So when we consider bringing literature into the classroom to represent a race, a people, and we know that there are at least two different groups of literature representing two different aspects of that people, why not bring in both groups? Why not take on the task of complicating the single story? This one sounds more natural. This one, uh, example two, sounds more conversational, but still is having a point, still is academic in the sense that it has heavy meanings to it. So I'm using italics, I'm using uh, short sentences, longer sentences, questions. I'm using a little bit of repetition intentionally in order to carry that voice and carry that emotion. So if you're writing something, you're writing about a problem, statement of the problem, but there's no, there's no emotion in this. If we don't really see or feel that it's a problem, then your readers might ask, I mean, is it a problem? Are you angry about it? If so, where's the anger? Are you annoyed by it? If so, where's the, ang where's the annoyance? You know how to do it. Use one word, choose one word that might actually convey that keep that writing voice in there. Because if you continue to write things without that writing voice, then you're gonna look back at your writing and see that this, it was just a waste of time because it does not speak to who you are and to what you believe. And last but not least, we have this accessibility. So when we are trying to write to Impress, sometimes our sentences get long. Grammatically, they could be correct, but they just get longer and longer and longer and creating overload for our readers. So example sentence, when you compose lengthy, uh, lengthy utterances, you take the risk of losing your readers in a sea of convolution, inundating them in a series of phrases that seem to continue indefinitely without stop, and appear a parade of lists, details, and side thoughts that, contrary to their intended design and purpose, weaken the point that you're actually trying to make rather than strengthen it, which is what you're making efforts to accomplish. It's a horrible sentence. Um, I wrote it, not to publish, just to demonstrate an example. One, it's too long. Two, it's redundant. Uh, continue indefinitely without stop, that's, you're saying the same thing. Uh, so a lot of this can be reduced because you have to think about who are you trying to reach? If we are writing to be read, can your population, your target audience access what you are talking about? 
If not, then why are you writing it? Shorten it if necessary. Add description if necessary. Make it engaging. Whether it's academic, formal, informal or not, writing can be engaging because it's communication. It's a tool for communication. So Zora Neale Hurston is cited for saying, it's no use of talking unless people understand what you say. So these three tips feed into that. Using punctuation to pace your readers so they can actually get through your sentences and understand what you're talking about. Using intention in your writing. So making sure that your sentences don't go on forever and ever and ever. And using description to add that power. And then also writing to express rather than to impress. All of that to connect and to complete that communicative task that writing is. For the sake of time, we'll, we'll skip the test. Um, but to keep this, all this, uh, these tips in mind, I am sharing with you, or rather uh, Kim is gonna be sharing with you a document that I created. It's a checklist uh, to, for you to use in your writing process so that you can keep um, the writer or the reader in mind. It's 10 different things to, to go through as you're writing or as you're revising. Like, is there variety in your sentences? Uh, does your sentence style support understanding? So, Am I able to understand, am I as a reader able to understand these, these sentences if I step away for a minute and look at them from the reader standpoint? So that's a free gift to you for you to use. I hope that it will be useful for you. Um, as I wrap up, so I have an editing business and I have, um, I offer various services, a network of quality writing support depending on what you need. Uh, I am on LinkedIn. You can just Google Vincent Price, uh, find me. I do, I have online instruction, writing courses and different books. I do one-on-one -on -one consultations. I do morning writing sessions um, in the morning for those people who want to write uh, in the morning for an hour and get that, that morning productivity done. Very similar to uh, Black Doctoral Network's uh, writing sessions that will be right after this one two hours though. Um, I also have things to help you uh, support your productivity and uh, formatting services as well when you get to that stage. So now we've come to the last portion, questions and advice. Uh, does anyone have any questions concerning um, writing in general or writing in particular? Uh, maybe you're working on something that <laughs> or maybe you're working on something that uh, is something you or you have a question about it or you want to try something now's the time you can either put it in the chat or you can unmute and and share what you would like to share Hi, I have a quick question. Yes. So um, I've noticed I am one to definitely be a little wordy in my writing. And part of that I'm finding now is because of my confidence in my writing. Sometimes like taking away the wordiness changes um, how confident you are in what you're saying and how you're presenting that information to your reader. And so I wanted to know if you could speak towards, you know, how to increase your confidence behind writing um, or really just behind publishing in general, putting your, your knowledge and information out there. Yeah, I can, I can try to do that because uh, I'm in that same space. I will say, I will say that we, we, we write from our own experiences. Right. And so there's no one who can write 
from this particular experience that I had. And so we have that confidence. And so even though, even though we feel that this, this particular article or this particular piece is, is the drop in the bucket, it still contributes to something. It's something that no one else, at least one other person has not been able to acknowledge, has not been able to see because their experience just does not line up with that. So I feel when I'm writing, I try to just capture that, that voice of mine. So if you're, so are you saying that you use more words because you lack confidence? Yes, yes, yes. definitely that. Okay. Because I think that's where I come in with the like, this may do this, and this is possibly this, instead of like, this introduces this topic and this can cause this issue, and very like direct, definitive statements that are confident in, in presenting information. I mean, definitely yeah. something I've def seen other colleagues be able to do really well, but it's something I have to sometimes make active choices to shift, but my first draft always has an enormous amount of, of, of almost like questioning behind how I've written certain things. Mm. So what I would say, you have to continue to make it an, uh, a conscious choice because I do the same thing. Uh, and the, the, the scholars, the colleagues that you know who write, um, you know, kind of straightforwardly, more than likely they've been doing either, they are constantly making choices uh, consciously or they've been doing it so long that it's become a habit. But whatever the case, you have to try to train yourself uh, to get to that point. And how you do that? Well, you can start by having a regular writing routine. I, that's advice that I uh, suggest for anybody who's looking to strengthen some aspect of their writing. So create a regular writing routine, whether it's for academic stuff or just journaling. If you wanna challenge yourself to, to lengthen or to shorten the amount of stuff you're trying to say and become more powerful with your word choice, then it has to become more of a practice. Because here's the thing, when the time comes for you to actually try to publish something, you might not want to take that opportunity to experiment. So creating a space where it's safe to experiment, it's safe to practice, I think will get you more comfortable with choosing that shorter route of saying what you mean without saying this should do this or this may do this or I'm attempting to do this. Um, and so the more you write about it, the more confident you'll feel about it in hopefully. Um, and the more you will feel that that writing is an extension of you. So if someone picked up that writing, they say, oh, that, yeah, this is you. This is her. Um, yeah, that's what Thank I would you. suggest. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I feel like you're moving into a question that uh, Victoria had. Well, she first asked whether you're on LinkedIn, but yes. she also wanted to know, um, she wanted some advice for people who sit down, uh, who want to sit down and turn, um, write, particularly for academia, and with that, figuring out a time to fit that kind of writing in. Huh. Okay. So you got to make a time for it. And the more stable that time is, the more stable and secure and protected that time is, the better. So um, for, for you, Victoria, and for anyone else who's looking, there are two opportunities, two spaces that already exist. One is with the Black Doctoral Network. And what is, they have our virtual writing sessions every week or so, I think. Uh, and they're two hours. Sometimes they, I think they alternate between the evening times and in the, maybe the afternoon times, but it's free and it's just a space to join and write with others. And so you're writing for two hours. Uh, you can keep your cam on or not, but you're not writing by yourself. So that's a bit of motivation. I also have uh, writing sessions, what I mentioned earlier, it's in the morning. First thing in the morning, I am a morning writer. My brain works better in the morning. And I 
I feel that by setting aside, aside time in the morning, I, it doesn't matter what else comes up in the day. My writing is already done. My writing time has been protected. So you have to figure out, uh, and if you want some more information about that, uh, let me know um, about joining. So you have to figure out, one, what type of writer you are, morning, afternoon, evening, uh, midnight. Okay, I see it. Um, and how much time you feel that you can dedicate to writing each day or certain, uh, certain days of the week. But don't just pick a random day that's, that's gonna be very, very popular to other events. If you can't protect it, it's already gone, okay? So that's advice to, to everybody. And morning time is the best for me. Same thing we're working out. If I don't do it in the morning, it's not gonna get done because other things come up. Um, and I believe that, go ahead, Kim. I also want to know if you are on LinkedIn. Yes, I am on LinkedIn. Uh, if you just Google Vincent Price, I, I should be one of those top, top ones in there. Uh, you should see my face as well. Um, okay, any other questions or what have you? Okay. If not, you can reach me. Um, you can visit my website, drpriceteaches.com. I offer various uh, types of support in various categories. You can find me on LinkedIn. Just search Vincent Price. You can find me on Facebook or Instagram at Dr. Price. Oh, so yeah, no, at uh, Price Stamp of Approval. Um, and so I appreciate your, your participation. I appreciate the opportunity to share uh, my experience as a writer and a and a copy editor. So um, yeah, you are welcome, Diana. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So anything else, Kim? Um, yes, thank you, Dr. Price. This was a fantastic workshop. I, I definitely felt like it helped me personally. And I see a lot of comments in the chat that people felt <laughs> convicted by some of the writing suggestions. Um, I almost feel like this could be a two-parter that you had a lot more that you could share with us um, that could help with writing. So I, I would be all for you doing a two-parter. Um, the other thing I wanted to remind everyone to please make sure that you fill, fill out the, the, um, the evaluation form. I will put it into the chat one more time. Uh, also, Dr. Price shared a tool. I can, uh, I'd be very happy to put that into the chat one more time. Evaluation just went online. And if there are any other questions for Dr. Price, you can reach him at his website. And it sounds like we are just at time. Thank you all for attending this workshop. And you will be receiving a certificate of your completion within a week or so. And Kim, uh, thank you. And last thing, I just put a link in for the morning writing sessions for anyone who is interested in, in more information about that, drpriceteaches.com slash join us. The more the merrier.